what we were designing was a system where users had this privacy utilizing zero knowledge proofs and every private transaction that one performed um, generated an encrypted transaction that was stored on chain. And then we had a dedicated network of nodes that using MPC was able to screen those transactions essentially. But importantly, there was no trusted entity that could screen or block a transaction. It was the network as a whole that ran secure multi-party computations over those encrypted transactions, arbitrary program execution in a confidential encrypted way but to also have the program itself be fully encrypted and to have encrypted random access memory. This sort of replacement for you purchasing some trusted execution environment. Um, now you can use this global supercomputer to execute anything. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course 1. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital and Ledger, trust Course 1 with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance on networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white label node, restake your assets on Eigenlayer or Symbiotic, or use the SDK for multi chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with Circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis Chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-host, Felix Luch. Today, we're speaking with Yannick Schade. He's the CEO and co-founder of Archeum. It is a private compute platform that allows for all sorts of interesting use cases, privacy uh, in crypto and beyond. So we'll be chatting with him today about Archeum, the architecture, their use of MPC, and much more. Yannick, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sebastian and Felix. I'm very excited. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in, in the encryption and privacy space and how you, how you ended up working on Archeum. Yeah, sure. So um, I think... Um, the reason why why um, I'm in the space of of building Archeum, building confidential computing, decentralized confidential computing, and privacy technology, at the end of the day, it might boil down to me as a small child reading 1984. I think that might be the, the honest answer. Um, I think that that really shaped uh, my my perception of the world and and my views of how the world should work and how. Um, how privacy and freedom matters. Um, and um, reading that as a child, I think really, really influenced me. Um, so um, at a similar age, I started programming, teaching myself programming, then studied law um, for a bit. And then um, through founding my first startup, pivoted to um, mathematics and computer science in the process, away from studying just law. Um, and then through the study of of mathematics and computer science, I met my co-founders, um, basically all of us caring about um, elliptic curves at that point, because that's what we what we learned about in university and then getting into zero knowledge proofs. Um, and through the process of that, ending ended up um, founding Archeum, which back then was called Elusive. Um, and yeah, with Elusive, we, we focused on building transactional on-chain privacy um, and with the added twist, I guess, of, of adding um, trustless 
decentralized compliance um, so that there's both privacy and still um, safety on the end of, of the users. So unwanted illicit behavior could be excluded from 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 this um, yeah on chain on chain privacy architecture. Um, and for that, we leveraged confidential computing with secure multi-party computations. Um, and through the process of designing the system and building this technology, what we realized is the, the huge potential um, and the revolutionary potential of being able to run arbitrary computations over encrypted data without having to decrypt the data first. So um, data in use can remain fully encrypted and anything can be processed um, on top of that data. And so um, that was really a pivotal moment, this realization for us, um, which then allowed us to, to evolve further into Archeum and fully focus just on providing this, what we like to call distributed global supercomputer that allows for confidential computing. Awesome, thanks for the quick overview. We're, we're gonna dive a lot into Archeum over the course of this, of course, uh, I think for me also interesting because that's like how I got to know you, I think working on Elusive and also like working in, in the Solana ecosystem. Can you maybe break down how you, how you started in Solana and in, you know kind of why you, how you came to the conclusion to add this like compliance angle? I think that was like kind of like one of the main differentiators there in, uh, in, in what you were building or in Solana. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I think how we got into Solana is the, is the story of, of many teams that are building on Solana. It was really the, the developer ecosystem. Um, and so um, the, the final co-founder of our team, actually, I met at a Solana hacker house. So um, uh, in the year 22, there were a lot of hacker houses and, and um, this really um, allowed developers wanting to build new interesting projects um, to meet up to to talk with experienced founders and then um, yeah test test the systems that they were building so um, that's what we also did how we came um, came about building on Solana um, and um, yeah back in the day with elusive um, what we what we were building was essentially a Ccash like on-chain privacy system which utilized zero knowledge proofs um, as, as core primitive. And the issue that um, basically all of those systems face at some point really is um, compliance concerns, right? Because um, we've, we've seen that with Tornado Cache essentially, right? So um, with Tornado Cache, um, there were enforcement actions by different governmental agencies because, yeah, they claimed that Tornado Cache um, didn't prevent malicious um, behavior on the on the platform. And if one utilizes mathematics um, to provide perfect privacy guarantees, um, um, yeah, that's that's the issue that they run into. And so, what we were designing um, was a system where users had this privacy utilizing zero knowledge proofs, and every private transaction that one performed um, generated an encrypted transaction that was stored on chain. And then we had a dedicated network of nodes that using MPC was able to screen those transactions essentially. But importantly, there was no trusted entity that could screen or block a transaction. It was the network as a whole that ran secure multi-party computations over those encrypted transactions. And essentially in a, within a black box, this virtual black box, were able to look into the transactions and um, assess what happened. And then they could find external consensus over um, yeah, malicious parties that, that tried to use that system. And then after the fact, um, reveal, reveal the, the corresponding information. Um, and so that was extremely powerful because, um, yeah, prior systems really attempted um, to, to add compliance by screening transactions um, upfront. Um, and with this system, a, a, a screening after the fact, uh, ex post, was possible, um, which I think um, would be the ideal solution. And that's something that um, is possible to, to build with Archeum. Um, but um, we really realized that, um, yeah, I think through the technology that we were developing, and we'll, we'll dive more into this uh, later, I guess, um, but 
um, the complexity of this MPC technology. I think there was just um, one area we had to focus on and we really saw our strengths in, in building this computing platform and um, optimizing the compute both for trustlessness but also performance. Um, and so that's what we ended up doing. Yeah, you know, in the case of, uh, you know, you mentioned Tornado Cash, like I, when, when I, when I heard about that, I, I couldn't help but be reminded of, you know, the, the cypherpunk stories of the nineties and you know, we had Mar Mark Miller on the podcast, tell us about how, you know, he used to print the RSA algorithm on t-shirts because the U S government considered that encryption technologies were, um, were considered under, uh, U S law to be, um, to be weapons, like to be munitions. And so therefore, you know, you couldn't export them. And there was this whole, um, you know, legal threat and sort of, uh, threat of persecution on, on those people in the nineties, you know, that, that were simply just freely expressing, uh, ideas and, and, and more to the point, like just making math public. Uh, and so like, I, I heard that, you know, the tornado cast story and like it, it, felt to me like very similar where, you know, these guys basically like wrote math that this stuff was, this stuff exists, uh, it cannot be stopped. And, and I, I think that we'll look back on turn into cash in the same way that we look back on, you know, the, the cypherpunks in the nineties and what they were doing. Um, there's really, you know, little one can do to prevent uh, malicious activity when you're using encrypted technologies. And I think it's like a huge societal debate, but I hope one that, uh, you know, people that sort of subscribe to the idea that encryption, you know, is just freedom of speech and, you know, is sort of like a right. Um, I hope that, you know, those people will fall on the right side of history. You know, having, you know, you, you said earlier you came into this space and you were kind of inspired to work in crypto, having read 1984, you know, how did you, how did it make you feel that, you know, you were sort of constrained to, to build a technology that enabled compliance um, when, you know, you had such this, you know, this very strong background and, and sort of ideological pedigree of like non-compliance in, in, the, in, in that sense. Yeah. So, um, I, I think that, um, so first of all, yeah, uh, I am 100% on this, on this, um, cypherpunk, uh, track. Um, I think one of my greatest, um, um, accomplishments in the in the privacy space would be um, getting my entire family to um, to use Signal and having the entire family group chat um, be be present on Signal instead of WhatsApp. Um, so I think this this compliance question um, is an interesting one, and the way I think about it really is um, that we gave control in the hands of the people using it. At the end of the day, there was no external action of enforcing compliance, it was essentially being able to have distributed consensus um, and giving users the option to use whatever system. Um, so it's um, the design that, that, that we designed back in the day with Elusive really was um, decentralized compliance. Um, so no centralized actor should be able to, to have any control. It should be the users that have control. And I think... Um, at the end of the day, and um, yeah, we never ended up getting to this point to to see that in action and and experience those um, those those game theory and network effects. But I think at the end of the day, um, yeah, it boils down to do users want specific other users um, using the servers for um, specific kinds of of, of use cases, um, and I think it's a bit more easy. Um, to to have these mechanisms um, with this um, yeah with those financial mechanisms attached, um, whereas it's way more different if it's just pure um, yeah expression of ideas right. So um, I think that's a system that made sense that um, at the end of the day found a natural equilibrium between both ends. Yeah, it's it's hard not to not to also bring up you know the the whole um story around the the telegram founder um who was arrested in france uh i think like last week um yeah any any thoughts on 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 that and you know what it means for the for the state of privacy technologies uh in europe yeah i mean to be honest it's very it's very difficult to say 
Um, I think Telegram is 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 difficult. It's difficult for me um, because um, on the on the encryption side of things, um, Telegram always, um, especially in yeah more more mainstream media, I think um, is being portrayed as this super encrypted private chatting platform that that cannot be hacked. Um, whereas in reality, um, there's no default um, yeah encrypted chatting between two peers, right? Um, so um, I think the story is is difficult. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to see. Um, at least, like you know, here in France, I've been watching main, mainstream media talk about uh, talk about Telegram as this uh, encrypted messaging. In fact, they 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 don't even use the word encrypted. They use this, this other word that in French that that doesn't even mean encrypted. It's not even you know it, the, and. It's like it's as if they were calling it a, a you know a, a cyber messenger instead of an encrypted messenger, uh, and um, and it's it's really painted as this kind of like black box thing, right? That, that you can tell that the story is spun in such a way when, in fact, you know, like every, anybody who uses WhatsApp you know, is in fact using you know, encrypted technology, and anybody who uses Apple Messenger is using encrypted technology, and Telegram is really painted with this with this very uh, negative sort of lens. So it's it's interesting to see how. You know, even the mainstream media here, and I'm sure probably in Germany and other places as well, is like very biased against these technologies for some reason. But anyway, not to make this all about about that. Um, you know, we do want to talk about um, Archeum and and what you guys are building. So let let's talk about you know confidential computing. So you know what does that mean, and what are the different ways that you know it has been implemented in the past, and what's kind of new uh, about the the way you guys are going about building it. So yeah, I think. Confidential computing has been around for for quite some time already, um, and at the end of the day, it means that computations can be performed over encrypted data um, without having to decrypt that data. So it's it's about so-called data in use, right? We have data in rest, um, which just lies encrypted on some hard drive, but data in use is the data that actively is is being used in a computation, and so confidential computing allows for that data in use to be secure. That's what, what confidential computing tries to achieve. And there's different different um, use cases, I guess, for confidential computing. Um, for one, creating a secure execution environment, right? Having sensitive data, critical um, critical business data, for example, right? That that has to be executed over in, in some cloud environment. And if that data were to be leaked, um, um, bad things could happen to companies, enterprises, um, governments, or individuals. So um, building secure execution environments. Um, at the same time, confidential computing um, allows for data collaboration, essentially. So um, individuals can have their data remain private while being able to interact with others. So. Those are two core aspects of what confidential computing tries to achieve. And um, there are different kinds of technologies that um, have been utilized in the past um, to, to achieve this. And I think the most prominent one um, so far has always been trusted execution environments. Um, and um, a few months back, I was in, in San Francisco at the so-called Confidential Computing Summit, which essentially is just a conference of um, trusted execution environment um, manufacturers um, and Intel, Microsoft, um, all those folks there um, praising their trusted execution um, environment technology. And um, yeah. I gave a talk there and I called it trusted execution is dead and we have killed it. And so my take really is that um, there's new kinds of technologies now um, that can replace those legacy systems that require trust. So um, what we are trying to achieve at Archeum and what the entire uh, decentralized confidential computing DCC movement, I think to some degree is trying to achieve is to um, add more trustlessness to, to confidential computing. And in our case, that's by utilizing multi-party computation. So maybe you can kind of, I guess, bring up the TEs already. And we have seen over the years, a lot of different types of attacks on these. I think 
uh, yeah, like side channel attack, um, kind of supply chain attacks. Um, and still, like, like you're saying, right, in the summit, everyone's talking about that. I think also in crypto space right now, TE seems to have another uh, like sort of resurgence and uh, popularity. Um, is that, or like, you know, uh, how, why is that maybe? And how does MPC approve on that? Or like, how do you, yeah, tackle that at Arcum? Like to sort of maybe explain also a little bit what these types of attacks actually are. Yeah, yeah sure. So, so trusted execution environments are dedicated hardware um, that um, comes with security and privacy promises essentially from from the manufacturers. Um, so um, usually that's dedicated hardware chips um, that have those secure enclaves is what it's called. So virtual machines uh, within those chips um, where data should remain secure, encrypted, and cannot be accessed outside of that of that enclave. And an enclave um, has a code base associated with it. So only this specific code base can be executed over that over that state, which um, sounds like a great concept. Sounds like a difficult to realize concept at the same time. Um, thinking about um, exploits and hackers. So those systems suffer from 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 many problems. I think. The most easy to grasp problem is the um, actually the complexity of building building architectures on top of trusted execution environments. Anyone who has worked with with TEs will will tell you that it's very difficult to build um, secure code on top of those enclaves because developers really have to um, have to ensure that data is being handled correctly and they need to give rigorous attention to detail um, that the boundaries between um, the secure and non-secure environments um, are being respected um, and that also at the same time brings uh, uh, yeah increased time to market I think because there needs to be a very um, very thought through development processes and those systems at the same time also um, on their own come with quite high costs associated. It's dedicated hardware and um, dedicated hardware that requires specialized folks that, that are able to maintain and develop um, on, on those platforms. Those are more of the soft factors that I don't like about working with trusted execution environments. Um, the bigger problems really are associated with the trust model. As the name already communicates, the execution here is trusted. and um, the trust model, in my opinion, is fundamentally flawed um, because, as you said, MTEs are really susceptible to a whole range of, of, of um, more or less sophisticated attacks. And um, I don't know if you guys saw this, but one and a half weeks ago, something like that, I think there was um, some, um, some researcher on Twitter that was able to extract um, the uh, root provisioning key um, from some um, Intel SGX family processors, um, which is a key that can be used to to fake so-called attestation reports. So trusted execution environments require this process of attestation where they prove to you that they are a real trusted execution environment and you can trust this environment so you can send your data in an encrypted way to that environment. And this attestation service um, yeah, requires some third-party trust. Um, um, yeah, regardless, on the processor side of things, um, there's side-channel attacks and hardware vulnerabilities. And side-channel attacks really um, boil down to you as uh, as the person having access to to the processor, or you um, being able to just track the execution of some program execution, and through this process of being able to look at, for example, power consumption um, or um, or tracking other metadata, I guess, um, that get, gets exposed through the execution of a program, be able to understand the execution path in a program, right? So if you think of an if-else statement and if some, some condition holds something complex is being executed, it takes one hour. And in the else case, the program just ends if the computation takes one hour, you will know, okay, 
um, the condition was true because the first branch was executed. And so that's that's um, the most simple form of uh, performing a side channel attack, right? And so those processors are prone to these kinds of um, side channel attacks. And there's um, many, many um, exploits that have occurred in the past and many fixes for those exploits, but it's always new um, exploits that, that get identified. Um, so in the blockchain space, we've seen a number of those kinds of exploits, actually. Um, I think the most notable one would have been um, Secret Network. I think that was end of 22, um, where there, I think it was called a seed key or something like that, some some master key that was shared between all, all the nodes in the network, all the TEs there, um, was exfiltrated. Um, and then anyone who ever ran a node in the network would have been able to um, yeah, re re remove the privacy of all transactions, right? So um, there's this inherent danger of side channel attacks, um, firmware, microcode, and SDK bugs. It's just this large development stack with um, incredible complexity, um, both on the hardware, but also on the software, firmware, microcode level, um, where at the end of the day, humans are building those systems. And so humans, in most cases, are also able to, to exfiltrate information. Those are one kind of, of exploits. But I think more important is, as you, as you mentioned, Felix, supply chains. Because when someone trusts a trusted execution environment, they're trusting a supply chain, a usually proprietary supply chain, which at the end of the day is just a chain of single points of failure. Um, single points of failure that can occur in the attestation process, can occur in the uh, manufacturing process. And I think a very striking um, example of how trusted these systems are is um, when, when Apple unveiled their private cloud computing platform, which is their own TEs that they, they supply for, uh, for, for um, model inference um, for their Apple intelligence. I think something that they stated in their docs, in their um, release article was something like, okay, they physically ensure that the, um, that the machines from the factory get placed in their, um, in their data center, right? So you can imagine um, people standing there with their assault rifles, protecting crates of, of, of uh, computer chips, uh, which is insane, right? If that's the trust model that you're working with, that there has been someone that was able to physically guard this chip from A to B. Um, I think that's not something that um, that we should put all of our trust in. So I, I wanted to ask you about like, because you know we've been focusing on SGX here, and I think like in crypto at least, you know, SGX has gotten a lot of negative uh, attention because of the secret hack and. Um, and, and, and some other issues. And like, I'm, I'm here on the Wikipedia page for, for Intel SGX and there's about, you know, a dozen different attack, uh, vulnerabilities that are mentioned. Um, but so w why is it then that, you know, we never hear of like the Apple TEE in our phones being compromised or, you know, even perhaps, uh, more interestingly, like ledger devices, uh, you know, they, they claim that, you know, they're super secure and, and they have like this whole, uh, um, where they call it, uh, the, 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 do the dungeon or something like that, you know, their, their, their whole like security lab that just pries all day at trying to crack a ledger. So why, why are TEs different or, or are they, you know, is this just a misconception or a lack of understanding of the technology? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, SGX has gotten a lot of attention. The architectures are, are significantly different in the details, of course, but um, the core architecture and the core reliance on, on these kinds of supply chains um, remains the same. And um, yeah, I think in general, um, this, um, yeah, I think tr so, so we, can, we can go more into that, how I think trusted execution environments can play a role in the future. I think they can play a role, but um, yeah, just this, this approach of using these systems and saying, well, so far we didn't see any exploits. So we can be sure that we can trust those systems and we can use them for, for all our future. I think that's a, that's a flawed 
a flawed approach um, because at the end of the day, it's just um, the sort of non-provable blind trust. Um, and in the case of Intel SGX, we've seen how, how fatal this can be really. And um, I think what's important, um, and that's something that I've, I think, never seen anyone talk about when, when talking about these kinds of supply chains. Um, um, in the case of Intel SGX, that's something that, that uh, we've seen with different kinds of, of teams that, that use that technology was that, um, okay, there's this supply chain and trust into Intel essentially and the person that has access to, to, the, to the computer chip, but there's also someone who deploys the code for the, um, for the enclave and they upgrade the code, they, they, they give updates and they have a private key they use to, to sign those updates. And so there's a single signing authority that can update whatever code. They can have their own local trusted execution environment, update the code and exfiltrate information. And at the end of the day, in most crypto projects that use trusted execution environments, yeah, easiest single point of failure really is some development agency um, sitting on some island, I guess, um, that has a private key that has full control over everything. Um, I think that's the that's the most shocking shocking aspect and that's overlooked a lot when when talking about the trust in the manufacturer most most of the times um it's it's even simpler than that it's the five dollar ranch attack you just you have to get the boat to the island <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> okay yeah that that's super interesting i think i guess we're we still haven't even talked about mpc so so let's uh get there i guess you know we're basically focusing on these hardware based models, but now we also have like purely cryptographically based privacy techniques and um, how do they work? And uh, like, what are their trade-offs and, and how do you like navigate that trade-off space? I guess that's gonna be the discussion for the next few minutes, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, essentially um, the other technologies are zero knowledge proofs, fully homomorphic encryption and MPC. Um, Zero knowledge proofs. We've spent a lot of time working with zero knowledge proofs. Are um, yeah, great technology. And at the end of the day, zero knowledge proofs are even part of those FHE and MPC proving systems. So, um, but but CK snarks, CK snarks, those those more more prominent proving systems. Um, yeah, they don't allow for what we are trying to achieve. What we're trying to achieve really is to be able to have some encrypted data, send it to some cloud environment, some some blockchain network, whatever, send it to some 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 computer and have it processed without that party that processes it um, having access to the data. And, and zero knowledge proofs are this um, two-party protocol where one party is the prover that has access to the data and the second party, the verify, ver verifier not having access to the data. So zero knowledge proofs on their own um, can't allow for those autonomous confidential execution environments. FHE, fully homomorphic encryption, um, allows for that. Um, essentially, the def definition of, of FHE would be um, to be able to, to um, execute arbitrary um, operations over encrypted data. So um, there's an encrypted representation of, of some state. And with FHE, um, two operations, essentially addition and multiplication, are homomorphic um, over that. Um, representation, which means that they yield an output that again lies in this representation. So that um, is a very, very good concept. Um, and um, the problem with FHE really is the practical um, usage of the technology, um, because um, the multiplications um, for fully homomorphic um, encryption um, result in noise accumulation and Noise accumulation requires um, bootstrapping. So bootstrapping operations essentially reduce the noise of this encrypted output. And if there's too much noise, that output can't be can't be processed anymore. So um, bootstrapping is required, and that um, results in very high, very high um, performance latencies and and computational overhead. And that means that. When using these kinds of um, FHE systems, um, there's 
many orders of magnitude um, performance latency associated. And so um, it's it's not unusual. And I think um, comparing the, the MPC protocols that we have with some FHE operations, um, it's not unusual for us to see um, something like us being faster 80,000 times, something like that. So um, incredible um, performance differences. And for very, very simple operations, um, FHE can be used, um, but um, yeah, more complex computations um, make this technology fail at the end of the day in, in practical implementations. And so the system that we are using um, is multi-party computation. And this multi-party computation uses so-called um, somewhat homomorphic encryption, SHE. And somewhat homomorphic encryption basically um, uses the efficient aspects of homomorphic, uh, fully homomorphic encryption that we, we also utilize there. But for multiplications, there's a smart trick associated, I guess, that allows us to, to efficiently perform those multiplications um, as well. And so um, that's why this technology makes most sense. And on top of that, um, what's also very important to realize with FHE is that um, moving from encrypted representation to encrypted representation is very nice. But if what if um, one wants to move out of the encrypted representation, right? If we have confidential on-chain applications and we want some transparent settlement to occur, um, there has to be a way to selectively disclose information about the um, the encrypted state and that's not possible with FHE by default and with MPC that becomes possible um, and so trust model wise what's the case is that the trust models for for systems in practice is the same for MPC and and FHE applications with MPC being many orders of magnitude faster and so um, that's why we arrived at um, building those systems with MPC Super interesting. And do you think, like, I guess in general, this is also something that FHE can ever address in a way? Like, is it something that, you know, over time the algorithm will get better? And like, and probably, right? I mean, but yeah, we'll be curious about that. That mostly boils down to to hardware acceleration. Um, so hardware acceleration is, is what matters most for that. There will be significant improvements, um, for sure. Um, and What's important is that those hardware acceleration improvements also um, get utilized by this somewhat homomorphic encryption system in, 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 in MPC. Um, MPC is still requiring network communication. Um, that's, that's, that's one difference, requiring some more network communication. At the same time, um, FHE, um, in order to achieve verifiable compute with FHE, you also require um, consensus mechanisms if you if you do it in the, in the blockchain setting. Um, if verifiable compute, which is highly important for, for any computation, especially confidential computations, um, um, if, if verifiable compute is achieved without using consensus, there's even more um, significant performance slowdown. So hardware acceleration is what it boils down to. And um, I think these kind of hardware accelerations will also um, be utilizable for, for the MPC protocols, um, especially with, with, recent, um, yeah, with recent advancements in those, in those protocols, um, greatly reducing the, the need for, for um, network communication. Um, so there's different um, yeah, options to, to be able to um, pack a lot more data within communication around. So um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, FHE will um, become more performant, but um, yeah, at this point in time, MPC just makes more sense. So it's always about um, yeah being able to supply the required privacy technology um, at this point in time and for the next years. And so um, it's the same with um, with um, fusion. Uh, energy, I guess, right? Um, we also need energy now and for the next 10 years um, without having fusion energy. So does this work with any type of computation? Can you do, can you perform really complex computations using uh, Archeum? And um, what, what languages 
can one write computations and does, MPC, does this implementation support like specific languages? Can you maybe explain that? How what what we are trying to achieve essentially as as um, as the vision with Arcium, um, and that's why I like to call it a supercomputer. Really, is for arbitrary program execution in a confidential encrypted way, but to also have the program itself be fully encrypted and to have um, encrypted random access memory, encrypted RAM, right? So to have a fully encrypted computer, you really um, have this sort of replacement for you purchasing some trusted execution environment. Um, now you can use this global supercomputer to execute anything arbitrary um, programs that um, are essentially arbitrary encrypted RAM programs. Um, the current stage we are at um, is that we support arbitrary computation um, support. And uh, for that, we have a, um, a dedicated compiler um, that compiles arbitrary Rust code um, into the um, into the opcode microcode format that our network understands. Yeah, so um, one could essentially be uh, be writing assembly code, so on the opcode level, what the, what the network understands. But um, what we offer mainly is the dedicated um, yeah, Rust compiler. Now, depending on the use case, um, different languages make more sense. So um, what we have at Arcium right now is two distinct backends, two distinct MPC protocols. One MPC protocol that is um, highly focused on being um, as trustless as possible um, for especially on-chain applications. Um, and we have another backend that is um, fine-tuned for um, floating point operations. So in order to perform um, operations over um, large matrices with floating points for machine learning. Um, and so for that backend, we, we support uh, um, a Python um, SDK essentially. Um, so one can use TensorFlow and Pandas like they would normally um, and now have it be confidential and have one party hold this data, another party hold another data and then collaboratively train um, yeah, some logistical regression or, or tree boosting um, model with that. So um, essentially Rust and Python for, for the machine learning applications is what I would say, yeah. Awesome. Let's maybe also take it back to like Arcium as this network overall, right? Like, so we talked about, you know, why you're using MPC and, and confidential computation, but to achieve this at scale, right? There is a, a network and there is the crypto component of it. So can you provide us like a overview over the you know, Arcium structure uh, architecturally as a, as a crypto protocol and, and how, how that functions. Essentially Arcium itself is a, you could say stateless computing network. So we utilize, um, existing ledgers, um, existing blockchains, um, for state management and computation scheduling. So, um, you can have your own smart contract on Solana, for example that um, has confidential functionality. And this smart contract then um, calls an Arcium smart contract that inserts a new computation within the Arcium mempool. The network picks that up, executes the computation and settles it back um, to the corresponding ledger. What's important is that the Arcium network itself, you don't write a smart contract for Arcium. Um, you, you can use our um, smart contract um, SDK and build a confidential smart contract, but the network itself just runs confidential computations and it picks those up from those dedicated on-chain mempools that can exist on different ledgers. And so I can build a confidential off-chain application and send such a computation request to the mempool um, and it doesn't have to settle back to the, to the dedicated smart contract. Um, now, how the network itself functions is essentially it's a permissionless network of nodes. And so um, the three of us could deploy a node in Arcium and we could open a so-called computation cluster. So 
um, our computation cluster could now be used by anyone to run confidential computations. Or we could restrict that computation cluster to say, okay, we don't care about providing computational services to third parties. We just want to run our own confidential computations. So it's fully configurable. Um, you can have clusters um, containing nodes from the network. You can run your own node. Um, and what's so highly important um, about the trust model associated there is that it's the dishonest majority trust model. So any computational cluster only requires one participant to be honest, one participant that doesn't um, collaborate with all the other participants in a, a malicious way. So um, with that trust assumption, you can um, have arbitrarily sized computation clusters um, and um, associate them with a so-called MXE MPC execution environment. So that's essentially this virtual machine instance that you create as a developer. You create this virtual machine instance where you have encrypted state, you have your functions that can be called, um, essentially analogous to a smart contract, if you will. Um, and that environment has one or more clusters associated that then process these kinds of computations. Um, now, the problem one on a theoretical level would run into is that um, such a computational cluster has this ideal trust assumption, only requiring the trust that one node is honest, right? Which um, for our blockchains we have uh, with, with practical Byzantine fault tolerance, we have the honest majority trust assumption. And here, this honest majority trust assumption, one out of N really is perfect. But the problem is that this also um, becomes highly dangerous for censorship because um, one malicious party could also censor computations. And um, that really has in the past been a practical limitation for those very efficient and trustless uh, MPC protocols. Um, because, yeah, deploying them in this permissionless setting could really mean that some malicious party could just DDoS the operation, essentially. And so what we have is a new kind of cryptographic protocol that allows to enforce um, execution and also correct execution um, um, for, for these computational clusters. So if you have this computational cluster um, and our cluster in this example, and Sebastian just randomly decides to um, share some invalid data with me, um, at some point I will notice that invalid data has been shared and I will stop the computation um, as I'm an honest participant. Um, the problem now is that by default, Felix and I wouldn't be able to cryptographically identify that Sebastian was the one that caused the computation to fail by sharing invalid data. Now with our new protocol, we are able, and actually everyone in the world viewing um, our, our computation from the outside is able to identify that Sebastian is the one that caused the computation to fail. And what that means now is that we can punish Sebastian for causing the computation to fail. And so that's where blockchains really come into play, that we are able to enforce execution of those computations um, and enforce this kind of correct behavior. So we are able to add accountability um, to those um, computations, which makes it incredibly powerful now, because then even smaller sized clusters um, yeah, can be performant, run those computations, um, and the, the deployer of, of these clusters can, can be certain that execution will occur. Um, and so that's where a staking and slashing mechanism comes into play. So co compared to other, you know, privacy projects out there, um, you know, how do you think Archeum is fundamentally different? Like what, what is really the, the, the key differentiator that you guys are offering as a product? Yeah, I, I think um, that really boils down to be trustless and performant at the same time. Um, because what we've seen really in the past is that, um, that systems either require trust via trusted execution environments or have incredible slowdowns with fully homomorphic encryption. And um, this sounds stupid, uh, um, uh, saying that as, as the founder of Archeum, but um, what I've seen in practice, and we are right now moving into 
um, our private test net and have teams um, building with Arcium really is seeing a lot of teams that have attempted building complex systems with FHE um, and yeah, pivoted to using Arcium because um, on the one hand, it's it's easier to use and on the other hand, um, it, um, it just yields um, the performance requirements that um, applications require. And so um, I think that's really what it, what it boils down to. And um, at the end of the day, um, all of that sort of is user experience, although trustlessness might be more hidden from the end user. And, uh, you know, in terms of applications, you know, obviously there's applications here in crypto and, you know, I'd love for you to maybe talk a little bit about some of the applications that you, you're seeing and that users, initial users um, are are building. But, you know, applications here go beyond crypto, I think. You know, if we're or if we're talking about the, the trusted execution environment market, you know, potentially, you know, clients of TEEs, of, you know, companies that use TEEs could um, shift to using um, technologies like Archeum. Uh, maybe also describe some of those use cases and you know efforts that you're making to address that part of the market as well. Yeah, sure. So um, I think that's also one of the uh, more interesting aspects to 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 building Archeum. Um, that it's not just um, yeah solving problems in the crypto space, but solving crypt, uh, solving problems um, for the entire world for for both enterprises, governments, any kind of, of organization, I think. Um, and um, that's also essential to, to the architecture design that we've, we've designed. And I mentioned that earlier, that you as a developer don't have to deploy a smart contract or build a smart contract in order to run confidential computations. You're essentially just accessing this confidential computing network. Um, and what that means is that um, on a crypto side of things, um, there's a lot of use cases, um, especially in DeFi and Deepin. Um, there's a lot of teams building um, building amazing stuff with, with our technology. Um, and also, um, I think, and that's, I've, I think, something that um, is less important to the crypto space, actually, and more important to the, to the traditional computing space is being able to run confidential um, AI, more specifically um, confidential machine learning with Archeum. Because in the past, um, confidential machine learning really um, hasn't been possible. And um, with this MPC-based confidential computing, what's so striking is that completely new types of digital interactions, I guess, become possible. Um, because if all of us have isolated data silos, isolated data sets of highly sensitive data that it on its own is valuable, right? All of us care about our privacy. We would never share that data. But um, this data, if we were able to in some shape or form pool it together and uh, train AI models um, using, using that data, that could become very valuable. And I think a very striking example for that would be healthcare, right? So very sensitive patient data. Um, that now can be utilized in a trustless way. New models can emerge that um, can help all of us without any one of us ever having to expose their sensitive data. Um, and this really is this collaborative element. And um, what we've seen is even um, logistic firms, right? So um, we, are, we are talking with logistic firms that um, want to improve supply chains, um, regardless of blockchain, they don't care about blockchain. All they care about is not giving their sensitive supply chain data to, to competitors, but at the same time, um, they can improve the supply chains. Um, they can all have um, the sort of win-win situation um, by using this trustless, um, yeah, confidential computing technology. So I think that's really the power of um, decentralized confidential computing to, um, to address traditional markets as well. And um, that's also what, what drives us, that it's not just building applications um, for crypto's sake, but building applications for humanity's sake at the end of the day, I think. So when, um, when considering the, you know, the RKM network, are, 
like I think one of the um, one of the important things to consider here, and I'd, I'd love to get your take on this, is the the censorship risk. So you know, for in the case of like uh, an application that would uh, handle the healthcare data of like an entire nation, um, if we had like a small number of nodes, there would be a risk of censorship, and so therefore you'd probably want to have as many nodes as possible in there. Um, does are, are there uh, basically so exit mechanisms to prevent uh, censorship, and also does does the network performance is the performance maintained as the number of nodes scale or do we end up you know does that uh, start decreasing as you add, add more nodes to the network yeah sure so um we have we have multiple mechanisms to 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 combat censorship i think the the first mechanism that i outlined earlier is um so-called on on a technical mpc um level it's called cheater identification so to be able to cryptographically identify anyone who 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 tries to stop a computation from from occurring and we can we can force everyone game theoretically to run a computation otherwise they get slashed they get punished um, now if such a misbehavior happens and the misbehaving party doesn't care about um, losing all of their staked assets um there's fallback mechanisms. There's so-called cluster migration. So to be able to move from one cluster of nodes to a new cluster, there's also cluster forking mechanisms so that nodes that um, want to censor, because maybe there's some, um, some, some, some kind of computations happening where one node says, okay, I'm not comf comfortable um, processing these kinds of computations. So there's really also this tension of, of censorship um, um, because um, we want to force nodes to run any computation at the same time. There might be, um, based on, on where the, the node is being operated, also legal implications to not be able to, to process certain computations. Um, and so we have both mechanisms. We can allow for nodes to say, okay, in the future, I will not want to process more computations for this corresponding MXE. And they can do that. They need to pay for the so-called cluster forking then. Um, and there can also be um, those forceful migrations if a node um, just doesn't jointly compute the function that they have to compute. Right, maybe taking it back to the use cases for like a potential final question where we talked a lot about Arcube being this platform and actually you already also mentioned initially you were building like this confidential confidentiality thing on, on elusive right like kind of more application focused almost or i guess in general the elusive product was more application now you're this platform and obviously if you're a platform you have to do like ecosystem building you're, you're mentioning you've been speaking to a lot of like logistics firm, like in healthcare, like traditional businesses. Um, and I think you also like mentioned like you yourselves met in the hacker house, right? In, in Solana, which I think quite interesting. And probably one of the best ecosystem building examples in all of crypto in the recent years, right? Uh, seeing like it brought also you together and, and just generally how successful Solana has been uh, with that. So yeah, the question basically is like, how are you approaching this? How are you getting people to build on, on the Archive platform? Yeah, so um, we currently have way too many people trying to build on Archeum. Um, that's um, that's the current status. So um, a few months back, when we when we announced Archeum, we we started accepting um, developer and node operator signups um, for for the private testnet, um, which we started rolling out. And currently, we are in the cohort one phase. So the first group of, of developers that um, get hands-on support from us, um, get access to, to all of the tooling and, and can start building applications. And step by step, we are, we are expanding um, those, those cohorts and, and adding more teams. So folks can join our Discord, um, can, can register to be able to um, be accepted to those private testnet development rounds, and then they get full access to Archeum um, and can build their applications and get um, yeah, development support from, from our end. That's, yeah, congrats on the success there for sure. Yeah, I hope we'll, we'll see like a bunch of cool applications 
Uh, Seb, any anything else from your point or? No, I'm uh, just like always uh, amazed that like these technologies, you know, as great as they are, you know, the the technologies that we really need, you know, like private compute, like more privacy technologies are not the ones in crypto that, you know, get the most attention or uh, get the most capital. And so I'm, I'm just really glad to see Archeum uh, like, you know, raised 5.5 million, uh, recently and, you know, from some pretty big VCs and, um, uh, and hopefully like take this technology to market. Cause I think it's, it's really important. You know, I also at some point, you know, brought all my family to signal and thought that was a really big achievement. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. even though, you know, signal might be backdoored and we have no real way of finding out, um, you know, but, uh, um, yeah, I think like this stuff is important and, um, and it's also political. I think you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that like encryption is a political issue more than just a technological issue. And so I'm glad we can talk about it here on this podcast. Thanks for coming on, Yannick. Thanks for having me, guys.